Hello, friends, and welcome back to the pod. Today, we have a very timely episode, and it might not seem like it at first because it is about the gut and digestion and dampness and gut dysbiosis, but in actuality, that is what we all need to be working on right now because of what the world is up against right now because we are currently going through the pandemic of COVID. And like you guys know, my parents went through it. Nick and I also both went through it after being around my parents and being exposed to them. So I had my own experience of what uh, the coronavirus felt like in my body and the symptoms that I experienced. And just like my parents, my symptoms were very much localized to my gut. So I had mentioned to you guys, I think, in the previous episode with Matisse about how actually my parents thought that they had food poisoning for almost two and a half weeks before they even started getting any sort of lung symptoms or chest tightness or signs of pneumonia or even a cough. And for my dad, he didn't really have a cough up until the end. Um, And that is exactly what I experienced as well. So um, about 10 days after being in direct contact with my parents, right before they went to the hospital, I started to develop gut symptoms similar to what my parents had. They thought it was food poisoning. That's kind of what I thought. I had nausea and diarrhea after eating. I was very uncomfortable all the time. I just had this constant sense of sourness in my stomach and I was nauseous even eating an apple. And I found it so fascinating because again, I had these 10 days where it felt like The virus was just incubating, where it was just kind of sitting there and waiting and waiting and being an opportunist and almost hiding out until I gave it the food that it needed in order to proliferate and really get virulent. And that's exactly what happened. So after 10 days of these really weird gut symptoms and the strange smell in my stool um, and being uncomfortable after everything that I ate... I had this one night where I had this insatiable craving. I could not stop thinking about peanut butter. And I kept telling myself, you know this, Olivia. You saw what your parents went through. You know that this is a damp pathogen. You cannot give this pathogen what it wants. I had been doing such a good job at kind of keeping it away. I was doing saunas every day. I was eating really clean, just kind of like protein and sweet potato and vegetables. And something like came over my body. And I had these gluten-free pretzels that were filled with peanut butter in my cupboard. And I was like a mad woman. I was possessed. And I went downstairs and I got the damn pretzels and I ate like half the bag. And as soon as I was done, I could feel whatever this was take over my gut. And I had the worst abdominal pain that I've ever experienced in my life. I was doubled over. I had pillows pressed up against my stomach trying to get some pressure on there because it was just the deepest pain that I had ever felt. And, you know, you guys remember I used to have IBS, so I was in pain all the time. And this is way worse than anything I experienced in the past. And Nick was so worried about me and I was trying to do all my teas. And finally... I had this tea of orange peel or lemon peel and fennel. And that was the one thing that started to move this exploding, expanding rock in my stomach. And that night, even though I drank the fennel and my stomach got better, the night that I ate the peanut butter pretzels is the night that I could feel it move into my lungs. And at about two o'clock in the morning, I woke up and had this dry cough and was so uncomfortable. And I could feel this pain in my lungs, basically in my chest and in the back of my lungs where you would feel it with pneumonia. And I was scared for my life, honestly, because at that time we didn't know a lot about coronavirus. We didn't understand how mild it could be for young people and for people without pre-existing health conditions. So I kind of called my doctor that morning. I almost didn't even want to tell her that I had these symptoms and that all of a sudden my chest was tight and my my lungs were hurting because I was afraid to say it out loud. I had just watched my parents not be able to breathe and I was so terrified that I'd end up in the same predicament. And she said, don't worry, Olivia, you're going to be okay. I just went through this. 
Same thing with my husband. You're going to have a few days where, yes, your chest hurts, you're uncomfortable, you don't feel well, you have muscle aches, but you're going to get past it. And she told me a few things to take. I kept doing my tea. And that is how I came up with my immunity that I have on my Instagram highlights that basically targets this dampness in the gut that is part of the perfect storm, shall we say, that gives COVID either the virus or the virus and the secondary bacterial infection that I believe it works with a chance to really proliferate. So (laughs) I thought I was a goner there for a minute. And sure enough, my doctor was right. I took all my herbs. I took my teas. I sang. I did my stretches. I did lymphatic drainage. I did all these things. And within a few days, I felt way better. But I have noticed that ever since then, I still have this issue with dampness in my gut. It's like my gut is 10 times more sensitive now after I've gone through this experience. So, you know, it's funny. I started off this year learning about dampness because I wanted to learn about PCOS and help women with PCOS. And I kept coming back to the fact that the root cause and lens of Chinese medicine is dampness in the spleen and liver stagnation. And that's exactly what we're talking about in this episode since it's all about TCM. And I knew enough about dampness because I spent the whole year studying it that I was able to immediately recognize it with COVID and feel it in my body. And like I said, I can still feel it in my gut. And I'm kind of grateful for the experience in a sense, because it's forcing me to be a lot more careful about the foods I eat and to not make as many exceptions um, with some of the damp foods that we all crave, like dairy and cold foods and sugar. At the same time, it's it's a big piece of the puzzle that we all need to pay attention to in terms of prevention and long-term prevention from any sort of gut dysbiosis, because in a Western sense, dampness is gut dysbiosis. So that's what we're going to talk about today in this episode. We're really going to get into Chinese medicine's idea of the spleen, which is their representation of digestion and the transformation of foods. And we're going to talk about how dampness is kind of the downfall of the spleen and all of the things that we crave that hurt our stomachs are hurting it in a sense because they are uh, creating this very damp environment. And I think that it's also very interesting to see that the people who are most affected by COVID, like my parents who have these underlying conditions, they have a lot of pre-existing symptoms of dampness, of gut dysbiosis, let's say. And I've been doing a lot of work on Instagram to kind of show you guys how gut dysbiosis and an overgrowth of a bacteria called Prevotella and perhaps other bacteria, again, create this environment where it's much easier for the virus to take hold and proliferate. So this episode is important for anybody who wants to improve their gut health. And it's important for anybody who's concerned about prevention of infectious disease, because we know that our immune system lies in our gut, so much of it. And the more that we do to take care of our microbiome and to balance our microbiome and to lower the populations of these pathogenic and opportunistic species, the better off we'll be in terms of any illness from the common cold to far more dangerous pathogens. So this is something that everybody should know and be working on and bring into their daily lives. And again, it's just (laughs) after going through this myself and seeing it in my parents, I've noticed some very interesting things about the damp nature of COVID. I even, uh, you know, was talking to my dad and he said that while he was sick, again, he thought he just had food poisoning. He didn't even think he could have coronavirus. But halfway through his sickness, he started to feel better. And then all of a sudden he had this craving for ice cream, which is the most damp food in the world because not only is it dairy, which is very damp and um, phlegm forming in Chinese medicine, but it's cold and it's sugary. So that's like a triple whammy. Those are three um, descriptors of food that would tell you that it's damp. And he said that, you know, as soon as he felt better, he had some ice cream. And then the next day he felt 10 times worse than he ever had. So again, just remember that this is a damp pathogen that really sits around and waits. And really all of the opportunistic pathogens that exist in our microbiome that are usually in smaller populations are also 
opportunistic and waiting for that time when we overindulge in damp foods to really get stronger and overgrow. So this is kind of a lifelong thing. This is almost like a guide to long-term maintenance of your gut. Now, what I mentioned earlier was that um, the people who are being affected are people who already have um, underlying conditions that have a lot of symptoms that relate to dampness. So I'm going to go over a few of those in this intro just to give you guys a background. So that looks like weight gain or the tendency to gain weight. People who say, you know, I just look at cake and I put on five pounds. Chronic bloating, fatigue, worry and overthinking because rumination and looping thoughts are um, kind of signatures of spleen or digestive imbalance in Chinese medicine. A heavy feeling in the body and legs, which could even come along with some edema and some water retention. Sticky stools. GI symptoms all the way to IBS and diarrhea or alternating diarrhea and constipation, phlegm in the lungs or kind of like this reoccurring phlegm where every morning when you wake up, you have to spit up mucus, recurring yeast infections or recurring sinus infections, and cystic type acne specifically. And interestingly enough, just remember that two aspects that I mentioned above the GI symptoms and diarrhea, as well as the phlegm in the lungs or lung infections are symptoms of COVID. So in TCM terms, straight from the acupuncturists working on the ground for months now in China, COVID is considered this damp toxin. So a lot of the COVID symptoms, not only in the lungs, but other places in the body, like the digestive symptom are going to present as dampness. So that means that anything that we do to reduce our consumption of damp foods and to boost our consumption of damp draining foods is going to be protective in some way, shape, or form. Not saying that it's a total solution, but again, for me, um, once I started the herbs and the teas that helped to drain the dampness and once I stopped eating the damp foods like peanut butter, I got a lot better. So to just kind of round out this intro and give you guys as much information as possible before we get into the interview... I wanted to go through a list of the damp foods. So that would be dairy, sugar, wheat, fried foods that are very greasy or have a lot of oil. Too many raw foods actually create dampness. Cold foods and iced drinks. So TCM is totally against any kind of iced drinks because ice and uh, coldness harms that digestive fire in the spleen. And the more that you harm the spleen and cool it down rather than supporting its warmth, the more that you harm the spleen's ability to transform water in dampness. So you really want to keep your stomach hot. You want to drink hot or room temperature liquids and you don't want to go for the ice. Again, like I said, peanuts, that was totally my downfall. And then ice cream. Once again, that's that triple whammy, dairy, sugar, and cold. And I think it's no coincidence that that's exactly what my dad craved right before everything exploded for him. And I've had a few other friends who had COVID give me accounts that were very similar where they had this uncontrollable craving for ice cream. And we know from animal research that pathogens can actually change your behavior and force you to crave certain things. And uh, the world of <laughs> microbes gets very scary very quickly <laughs> or just creepy, let's say, because they almost exert this form of mind control that's more biological than it is mystical, um, but it's still very fascinating. Then we have the list of damp draining foods. So foods that would be really good to consume right now or teas that would be wonderful would be the microbiome tea or the immunity that's on my Instagram highlights that has ginger, orange peel, onion, cloves, garlic, fennel, anything that you have on hand in your spice cabinet. Chamomile tea is really good too. Green tea is incredible. Small amounts of raw honey can be very healing to the spleen because it strengthens the spleen just enough to help it transform that dampness. Good quality protein is very healing as long as it's not fried or breaded or too oily because protein helps to strengthen the spleen as well. Pumpkin and other cooked orange and yellow roots, so sweet potato would be nice as well in moderation. Ginger in your cooking, and like I said, ginger in your tea cooking with onion and garlic or any other pungent foods and spices, 
other warm aromatics in your food and drinks like cinnamon, cardamom, even horseradish. You want to think of dampness as this almost swampy situation in the gut. And anything that's warm and spicy and aromatic is going to go in there and just disperse all of that stuck or trapped phlegm and liquid. Bitter vegetables that are cooked or steamed, so especially any sort of cooked greens would be wonderful. Artichokes are great. Watercress is awesome. Asparagus, broccoli, all that good stuff. And then finally, eating carbs wisely and moderately, because as I've said on my Instagram stories where I talk about Prevotella, which is that secondary microbiome overgrowth that I believe is implicated in COVID, really enjoys a high carbohydrate, high sugar diet. So right now, just in terms of prevention and protecting the spleen and reducing dampness, you would want to focus more on protein, vegetables, and just, again, eating those carbs wisely and focusing on whole food carbs like rice, sweet potato, pumpkin, plantain, oats, all that good stuff. And finally, exercising helps to drain dampness. And interestingly enough, bringing it back to the Western side of gut dysbiosis, exercise has been shown to modulate the microbiome and reduce species like Prevotella, which again I mentioned is a bacteria that I believe is either a secondary infection in COVID or is kind of thriving when the virus lowers your immune system enough to where that opportunistic pathogen can overgrow and take over. So if you want to learn more about that on my Instagram, I have a highlight called Immunity and another highlight called Prevotella. And I'm hoping that that will continue to be researched by all of the scientists who are really trying to crack the code of why COVID is so deadly for some and so mild for others. And I think that Prevotella gives us a really good lens in which to explore that because children have very low um, populations of Prevotella. And the more diabetes or hypertension a person has, the more their gut is swinging towards a Prevotella-dominated enterotype. So <laughs> I hope this wasn't too much information. I have so much to say right now. I am like researching every single day, trying to bring you guys um, updated info on COVID from my perspective and experience with my parents. And I hope to have a whole episode on Prevotella and the gut microbiome soon. But for now, <laughs> enjoy this episode where Dr. Kara takes the whole spleen and dampness conversation one step further by addressing one major thing that we can do to support the spleen, which is to actually go back to basics and support the liver. So this is where she gets into a conversation about hormones as well and really brings it full circle. And I think it's going to be a great introduction to Chinese medicine for so many of you that are interested in this ancient system. So please enjoy. I'll see you on the flip side and uh, let me know what you want to hear next on What's the Juice? Hello, everyone, especially my traditional Chinese medicine enthusiasts. We have a very exciting episode today with Dr. Kara Auckland. Uh, she's a doctor of acupuncture. She's a cupping specialist. She practices herbal and nutritional medicine, the whole nine. She's quite multifaceted, and she's here to talk to us today about our livers, Perhaps not the actual anatomical organ of our livers, but the Chinese medicine understanding, which relates to so many hormonal issues, PMS, frustration, depression, so many things that we all deal with on a daily basis sometimes. Um, so this is going to be a really important topic, especially for women out there and just for anyone who's feeling stressed. Um, so welcome, Kara. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. Um, and just one little clarification. So of my course. name yes. is, I have a super long last name. Oh. It's Maura Marco Kendrick. Oh. And so Aculand is like I'm that dead. dreamy. <laughs> no, you're not the first one. I'm like Auckland, Australia, right? <laughs> or like a New Zealand. <laughs> so Aculand is like that dreamy, euphoric, deeply relaxed and calm feeling. Oh like my that goodness. place you go to during acupuncture. So that's like Aculand. Aculand. Like Disneyland. I knew you were looking for... at me like this chick <laughs> is just, that's not my government name, girl. Um, okay. Caramora Marco Kendrick is kind of long. Caramora Marco Kendrick. <laughs> okay. So for now, it's Dr. Dr. Kara. Kara that's or no, just Dr. Kara. Okay, Aculand Dr. Kara. is like... Your brand. The brand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the woman, the brand. Aculand, yeah. We love that. 
So what I like to ask guests at the top of every show, I have two questions for them. One is it's time to sign in. What's your sun, moon, and rising? And if you don't know the other two, you can always do just your sun sign. Oh, I'm in Aries. Ooh. I, mean, I, f- I forget the other. I just looked up. I know the exact time, and I know I'm a manifesting generator, I think. <gasps> oh, yeah. we have another I'm manifesting yeah. generator over in that corner. Um, that's pretty cool. Okay. And as if I couldn't tell you're in Aries with the pink and the red tones and the hair, like, okay, you're, you've arrived. <laughs> She's an Aries moon. And then what would you title this chapter of your life? Hmm. Wow. That is a question. I know. I'm like, just a quick question. <laughs> this has been like the year of travel and I would say just expansion, maybe. Ooh. Yeah. Expansion. Yes. Expansion. So obviously today I really wanted to talk to you about this very widespread, very common pattern of liver chi stagnation. That's kind of what's behind the some of the women's hormone issues, PMS, um, depression, frustration, even like down to cysts and fibroids, right? But before we even get into liver chi stagnation, let's just give everyone a really basic intro to all of these wonderful concepts in Chinese medicine. What is our chi? Yeah, so definitely. <laughs> liver chi stagnation is one of my favorite topics. So chi, chi can be described as energy. So it's like in Ayurvedic medicine or like yoga, your vital force, mm. your prana. It's just like what moves things mm. to your energy, maybe your spirit. That's your chi. I love that. Yeah. And so the chi also um, is what moves the blood. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So the chi flows throughout the body mm-hmm. and it moves the blood. So if the chi is low or deficient, if you're lacking in chi or energy, the blood starts to stagnate. Okay. And doesn't move freely. So we all have chi, right? Oh, absolutely. We, Everyone has chi. It's like our, yeah, our basically when you wake up and you jump out of bed in the morning, your chi is probably flowing and, and happy and vital, shall we say. (laughs) If you jump out of bed. (laughs) If you jump out of bed. So we're going to talk about what happens when you don't jump out of bed. Right. When you're hitting the snooze button, Mm -hmm. when you're feeling exhausted, what would it look like if someone had this Chinese pattern of a chi deficiency? Um, And how can we increase our flow of chi when it's not optimal? What does that look like? Talk to us all about that. Right. So chi deficiency has several different symptoms. So one of them could be, you know, fatigue, tiredness. Mm -hmm. That's also combined with other other symptoms like spleen chi deficiency, which we'll get into maybe later. Um, But in general, you might uh, get sick easily. Mm. So if you're prone to catching colds, that could be part of chi deficiency. Also sweating easily because it doesn't, the chi is responsible also for like opening and closing your pores. So if your chi is weak, the pores will be open. So you'll maybe tend to sweat easily. Wow. I sweat a lot after drinking coffee. Is that related? Could be. Interesting. Yeah. What about someone who doesn't sweat even when they're exercising like crazy? That that could be a more complicated imbalance. So <laughs> I would have to go through and ask <laughs> maybe a hundred different questions to really get down to the reason. Which I love that answer yeah. because that's a lot of the times the answer I give people when they message me like, what product yeah. of yours is good for this, isn't this? And yeah. I'm like, well, why do you have this, this, right. and this? We need to do a thorough intake. Yes. You know? yeah. Yes, absolutely. And we keep coming back to on this show the fact that anything that you're doing in the realm of natural medicine, it's not this quick fix. And often the problem is not what you think the problem is. Right. It's everything's complicated and connected. Yeah. But in some way also just very simple, like stress. (laughs) Yes. That's another common theme on the show, stress. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And and what I love about traditional Chinese medicine is that it gives you this cool pattern that where all these connections come through and sprout up and you're like, oh, that makes sense. Well, my chi is this and my liver chi is constrained and blocked. Mm -hmm. So, We know what the basic chi is now. And for the second part of the question, when someone is feeling tired or they're getting sick a lot and they have this chi deficiency, how can they kind of bolster that and improve that? Right. So definitely we really want to boost that chi. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, acupuncture is great for that. There's specific points that really strengthen that system, your chi and your blood. Um, Really getting enough sleep. That's something I stress a lot. Mm -hmm. If we're not sleeping enough, then we're not going to recover So it's all about balance in life. And you touched on the spleen chi as well, because Mm -hmm. when we're transforming our food, the spleen is like that pot that cooks the food and transforms it into Mm -hmm. nutrients. And you you need to be transforming your food properly to even create more of your chi. So talk to us a bit about the spleen chi deficiency before we get into the liver. Right. Okay. So classic spleen chi deficiency signs, fatigue, maybe fogginess in the head, um, 
they could have a pale complexion, kind of that puffy tongue. Mm. There might be, if you stick out your tongue and you see that there's teeth marks or like scallops around the edge, that's a very classic spleen chi mm. symptom. Uh, bloating, you could have loose stools. So it'll be kind of like a digestive upset bloating after Absolutely. meals. You'll definitely yeah. notice this. So people out there who have maybe gut dysbiosis and they're framing it that way, the Chinese equivalent is going to be a spleen chi deficiency. Very likely. Yeah. And it's pretty common. Yeah, absolutely. And talk to us about the iced drinks and cold oh, yes. foods. Why we, is spleen chi deficiency so common? We love to talk about that. <laughs> so th during an intake, I always ask my patients, so what's a typical you know day of eating for you? Okay, well, I start with the smoothie in the morning. Mm, my know? God. And then like, is it frozen? Yeah, some frozen spinach, frozen berries, um, and then a salad for lunch. <laughs> and their chief complaint might be bloating. Oh, so yeah. it's, you know, oh, we just fix a few things. So I describe the digestion, like this digestive fire. I have a nice little mug that looks like a cauldron on my mm. desk. And if you imagine your, your stomach, your digestion, like this cauldron with a fire underneath, that's your digestive fire. That's like helping transform and break down your food into energy. And if you are pouring like ice drinks over it or a cold frozen smoothie, just really makes it hard. It, it makes your body work harder to digest. And yes. we like warm foods we for that love reason. Warm foods. Yeah. So to that note, a lot of people are skipping breakfast nowadays, which is a whole nother mm -hmm. conversation. I get the whole intermittent fasting thing. I keep touching on this, but you kind of need to start that fire up in the morning. You need to put a few logs in there to kind of get things kindling. So there's an importance and an emphasis on breakfast in TCM as well, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And I think you have a blog post about I it. I do. Yes. <laughs> we'll about link that in the show the notes. The stomach, you know, the, the time, the breakfast, you know. Yes. That's when the stomach is optimal. So like starting with like maybe some oatmeal or, you know, yeah. e eggs or something warm. And in a Western paradigm of like looking at the nervous system, as the day goes on, you become more and more sympathetic dominant. You become more in that fight or flight mode as we get later into dinner time, for example. So actually your digestion is strongest at breakfast time in terms of your nervous system functioning. Mm -hmm. And also in the Chinese paradigm, your digestive fire is strongest because the sun just came up in the morning and especially it's at like lunch that yang time. time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seven to nine is spleen time, seven mm -hmm. to nine AM. Yeah. So you want to be ideally eating your breakfast between those hours. Yeah. Um, and I had an acupuncturist who always said like, make sure you're eating when the sun is out. Like obviously mm -hmm. sometimes we have to have a late dinner. It's all yeah. good. But optimally, right. you want to eat when the sun is out because our bodies mirror nature. So they're going to, our digestive fire is going to mirror that fire of the sun. Um, and with that cauldron theory, we want to mm -hmm. keep kind of just putting those those logs to just slowly throughout the day, keep your food consistent. The consistency, yeah. The, yeah. All the classics are really into let's have proper meals <laughs> um, and just eating in general. I think we could probably have a whole talk on how to eat and how we're all doing it wrong, including myself, like inhaling food in two minutes. Yes. And then we wonder why we can't digest. And let's own up to that because yeah. as you know, you're an oh, established practitioner. I I'm, become I'm one. the worst. <laughs> and my assistants are always getting on my case. They're like, you need to schedule a lunch break and you need to sit down and eat slowly. Yeah. And I'm like, no, no, no time. <laughs> <laughs> no time. I have to help people. And then yeah. you're like, wait, but I need to help myself. Yeah. Balance. Yeah. Exactly. Balance. Some days you're not going to have that happen and that's okay. So it's I'm like, like I should maybe fast those days. Maybe. I haven't, but. Got you. Eventually. So before we move into the liver, I just want to go back real quick to that smoothie point because oh, I yeah. kind of cringed when you said mm -hmm. the smoothie aspect. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. A lot of people are trying to do something really good for themselves mm -hmm. by packing that frozen spinach mm -hmm. in. They want their nutrients. Um, but like you said, it's going to, you kind of have to now bring that ice cold food mm -hmm. up to your body temperature. So you're using your yang chi, your spleen chi mm -hmm. to do that rather than using the spleen chi for the transformation and the digestion mm -hmm. of the nutrients. So what is your advice for people exactly. who are like, but I need my right. smoothie for... Well, I tell them you don't have to have a frozen smoothie. Like maybe take the ingredients out of the freezer the night before, put it in the fridge, blend it up, not frozen, and then mm. wait a little bit. So you can have your smoothie, just not frozen. Got you can it. still have all the veggies in there and all the good stuff, mm. but just not frozen. It and the salad have to be for hot. lunch, maybe a warm I, salad? I say warm salad. Yeah, absolutely. Roast the veggies. Just like if you want a little bit of the raw lettuce, okay, but not everything raw on it. Mm -hmm. Just have some warm, warm salads. And how would great. Chinese medicine see like raw veganism, like raw food? 
a dampness. It creates this dampness. Hmm. And, can and what does dampness mean? So dampness is can be like a phlegm aspect or just if you have water retention, like edema, if you think of kind of like a soggy situation. Hmm. Okay, so that also kind of is into the gut dysbiosis paradigm of yeah. like creating the bloating. And yeah. um, I was told that one of the ways you can know you might have a bit of dampness in the spleen is... I mean, this is quite graphic, but I guess we have to to give the people the truth. We get into the details. So when you're wiping after Mm -hmm. using the bathroom, if you have if you have to wipe like five or six times to get everything because it's kind of damp and sticky Mm -hmm. and staying on the tissue paper, would you say that's one? That would definitely be some dampness. Yeah, and the spleen just generally tends towards dampness. Mm. So like the spleen, we say like the spleen hates dampness. Yeah. And what are damp foods? Oh, yeah. All the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you like. <laughs> Fried foods, right? Yeah. Fried, yeah. Greasy <clears throat> dairy. Um, of course, like all the ice cream, cheese, pizza, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. So, you know, a lot of people who are like lactose intolerant or mm-hmm. think they're lactose intolerant, they'll have a loose stool mm-hmm. after eating or like a stickier stool after mm-hmm. eating dairy. That's like the dampness aspect. So maybe yeah. part of lactose intolerance is already having that damp spleen. Could be. Yeah. And that's what's difficult too about these moistening, nourishing herbs mm-hmm. is that a lot of times these yin tonics, mm-hmm. like a Solomon seal, um, they are moist. Like right? too They're, much can be cloying. And yeah, like exactly. if you eat too many long gone fruits, yeah. you know, which are great for the blood and your spleen chi, it can go the other way. So you kind of want to be protecting your spleen chi. And would that be with something like a ginger tea? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. What are some other ways to protect the spleen and kind of increase that digestive fire? Yeah. So like we talked about warm foods, Mm -hmm. um, warm foods, ginger tea, maybe some cinnamon in that oatmeal. Yeah. Right. Those, those warming herbs. And then though, we do have to be careful. Some people are having cinnamon and ginger all the time. And if they have a lot of heat signs, it Mm -hmm. might be too much. Absolutely. Yeah, I talked about that when I was doing my adaptogen video about ginseng. I'm like, if someone is really hot and angry Mm -hmm. and frustrated all the time and they need the AC on, like they are not a ginseng person. A ginseng person is really cold and tired all the time. Right. So there's this element of matching the herb to the person. Yeah. Okay. So bringing it back to how we can help our spleen chi directly related to our liver chi. Ooh. Okay. Let's get into it. That's how we can uh, address the spleen also. What is the liver? The liver. So it's different in Chinese medicine than the actual liver organ in Western medicine. Mm-hmm. So if we we tell our patients your liver chi is stagnated, like no, there's nothing wrong with your actual liver unless you have, you know, if your liver enzymes are off. But the liver chi is responsible for the free flow of chi in your whole body. So when the liver is happy and the chi is flowing freely, like we feel pretty good. You know, our emotions are stable and you know. We're, we're in a good we're doing mood. it. Um, but it's very easy. I would say if you live in a big city, you probably have some liver cheese stagnation. And oh, that's yeah. just kind of equal stress. I always use road rage as a perfect example. Oh, for sure. If you are driving <laughs> in traffic... <laughs> you're likely to have some liver cheese stagnation. Yes. And it's also that like sitting, like you're sitting there, you're getting frustrated, you're getting yeah. hot, yeah. you're angry. All of these things are constraining that. Right. But really, if your chi is pretty smooth, it shouldn't bother you so much. Yeah. Like, I'm pretty, I'm chill. Like I'm, I'm in the car. I'm okay. But if I'm late for something, it's like my pet peeve. If I'm on time, I'm late. Like I have to be 20 minutes early. Oh, um, so you're protecting your liver chi by yeah, leaving yeah. early. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, what just, a good tip. I have to be, you know, chill. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And so someone who has really smooth flowing, healthy liver chi, they might be the person who's letting people Absolutely. go in front of them. Yeah. Nick. Yeah. Where, and where is you're he? not honking at people. You're like, okay, go ahead. Love that. Yeah. Oh, we love a boyfriend with smooth liver chi. Okay. So now again, it's a whole meridian. It's not the mm-hmm. anatomical organ. Right. It may include the liver gallbladder right. if we are connecting this paradigm to the Mm -hmm. Western paradigm, but it's so much more than that. So it's also related to our tendons, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the liver is in control of our muscles and tendons. So people that have really um, 
like poor flexibility, very, a lot of tightness in their muscles. We'd work on the liver, well, liver and gallbladder channel for that. Mm -hmm. And those are two organs that are very connected. They're paired. Yes. Yeah. So in Chinese medicine, we have 12 main meridians and then they have, they have their pairs. They have the yin so and the yang organ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're kind of like buddies. Okay. Love that. And so Lastly, the, the other aspect of the liver that always interests me is that it opens into the eyes. Mm -hmm. So are there some signs, like maybe someone whose eyes get red often, right. what are some signs in the eyes of liver cheese right. stagnation? So the red would be like a fire, a heat. Mm -hmm. And so when the liver cheese stagnation is there for a long time, it can turn into heat. So that's showing the red eyes. You might get headaches or dizziness also. Um, that would be a sign of like the liver yang rising, maybe hypertension. Mm -hmm. um, if you get irritable really easily, like a really short fuse. Would this heat, I'm just thinking of mm -hmm. the face, would this heat also manifest in like some skin conditions, it, some mm -hmm. acne, some rosacea? Definitely, yeah. Whenever I see skin conditions, acne, rosacea, or eczema, there's other things involved, but we're always looking at the liver. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because so many people have used my liver juice formula specifically for eczema. Yeah. And I haven't really, I didn't advertise it that way in the beginning, but it's like it became a thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, like mm -hmm. this makes a lot of sense when yeah. you think about the heat that builds up from liver cheese stagnation. Right. And then tying that into the Western, actually, like if someone's eyes are yellow, that's jaundice. So it's showing like they knew, they knew about this stuff a long time ago. They that knew. It goes into Ex eyes. You know, that is such a good mm -hmm. example because people are like, oh, yeah, well, Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine, it's right. not our, right. you know, accredited modern curriculum. Mm -hmm. But it's like, like you said, there, there's these concepts of, oh, the livers and the eyes. And to someone that sounds so out there, but right. then you bring it back to, hello, when you have jaundice, your eyes get yellow. Yeah. That connection's been around for so long and it's shown in the body. Yeah. And so now there's functional MRI. So I always like to bring it back to also the science and research. Um, all the doctoral program is like evidence-based because we need to like, we need to show and prove it too. So functional MRIs show the points being active. There's a point on our gallbladder channel, gallbladder 37, mm -hmm. it's up on the leg. And the name of it is brighten the eyes in China. So they knew, somehow they knew that this point helps the eyes. So they've done scans where this point will be needled and the visual cortex in the eye will light up in, oh the, in the MRI. Oh, wow. So it's really- Can you yeah. show us where that point is for those who are watching on uh, yeah. video? So we're going to go up this bone here and it's right in there. So the gallbladder 34 is here and then we have 39 and then it's- 37, so it goes up there. Okay. Yeah, because it starts on the eye, so it goes down the gallbladder channel. Love that. Yeah. You know, interestingly enough, this summer, I'm, I'm deathly afraid of bees. Oh. It's like a congenital thing. I'm not sure. Never been stung by a bee until this year, so why do I have this fear? Probably my grandma. So I was at a on, walking on a track, and there was a bunch of bees nearby. And you know bee venom therapy mm -hmm. is like something that's really wonderful and emerging. Yeah. And the bees kind of know, the animals know, you know, we've had situations in the news where a dog has identified a tumor in someone and they're mm -hmm. licking that area. So it's like also that that's got to open your mind a little bit too, right? <laughs> but to come back to the story, the bee stung me right in GB25. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> so you think the bee knew I had some liver cheese stagnation? Uh, maybe it's funny. I've heard some of my teachers uh, have said that if you get like bug bites, mm -hmm on the meridian like points and channels that there's something going on there. I'm not like a hundred percent sure if I believe that, but it's interesting. I mean, it it's was like the exact yeah. point. And and it, it, was so giving you some, it was giving you some acupuncture it was. or therapy there. <laughs> I'm telling you, that was like, I was in such a good mood that day. So that's my example of Even when after my liver. getting stung. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Because it was like, it just opened things up. Yeah. Like I really needed it. So now I'm not <laughs> really that afraid of bees. <laughs> Nature's looking at me like, yeah, okay. You can tell yourself that. Okay. So we're getting more into the, the liver's jaw. We talked about yeah. the connection to the eyes, brightening mm -hmm. the eyes. And can you talk about the liver attacking the spleen when oh, we yeah. watch TV while we eat? Okay. Um, I love to teach my patients about this. So it's like the five elements, mm. the earth, water, fire, wood. So the liver is this wood energy. And then we have the spleen, which is the earth. So the liver 
in five elements can, we call it like attack the spleen or overact on the spleen. Mm. So when our liver, you know, we have the liver cheese stagnation, the stress, it can weaken your spleen and stomach digestive energy. Got it. So, so you, that's, that's why you got to watch your there. stress. Yeah. Because so many of the symptoms we see are bloating and, you know, all these abdominal digestive issues and they need to address that. But the root can actually be your, your liver cheese stagnation. The problem's not the problem. Yeah. That's really interesting. So it's the, the fact that you're watching TV or you're looking at your cell phone mm -hmm. and you're activating basically your liver meridian by doing right. so. You're charging up the eyes, charging mm -hmm. up the liver, but you're supposed to be focused on giving that Eating, energy right. And that attention to your food. We're always taught also like don't stu like don't study while you're eating too. Don't be reading. Mm -hmm. Like don't use your mental activity. Like you And what's that connection to the spleen? The okay, so overthinking is actually the spleen. Ah. Like worry. Like students have, you know, have this <laughs> issues because we're studying all the time. But too much, like too much thinking, mm. too much over studying damages the spleen. So you're using your digestive energy for thinking and worrying about a test rather than digesting. Maybe like all the blood's going to your brain instead of your stomach. <laughs> there you go. Cause the brain is a very highly active metabolic organ. Mm -hmm. um, and so is the stomach. So yeah. we got to divvy up this blood supply somehow. You're reminding me of on how to have better digestion now. <laughs> love that. Yeah. I'm all about the theory, you know, you're all about the practice, which yeah. I love. And I'm just like this baby practice budding kind of thing. But I'm deep it's great to the go theory. back to the theory. I'm I'm excited to go back to the theory. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Um, have you touched on chewing at all? I I'm thinking of you were reading my mind. Go for it. Talk about it. Well, yeah, part of I know you talk also in your digestive uh digestive juice about this. Our digestion starts in our mouth, right? When we're chewing. Mm. But we just inhale our food. We have like two bites. So we're not you know, really breaking that down so we can. And we're not starting with the carbohydrate digestion, right. which is in the mouth with the, the saliva. saliva. Yeah. So we're forgetting we have all these different digestive yeah, juices. There's so many things we can do to help ourselves. So just by like actually chewing our food. Love that. So chewing is good for the spleen, focusing on your food. I've also heard like focusing on the flavors in the food, kind of saying to your dinner mates like, oh, wow, I can really taste, you know, the cinnamon in this mm -hmm. curry or the, you know, the spice in here. Or I, how did you make this? Like really making it about the food and the activity of eating mm -hmm. is so lovely for the spleen. Yeah. And then too much sweetness oh, is, oh, is, not good for, is not good for the spleen. Although the to tonify, we do use sweet herbs, but mm. then it's just too much of it. So talk about the five flavors and relating to organs. Right. So we have the liver is sour. So the liver likes sour. Mm -hmm. The heart is bitter. Mm -hmm. So we got those dark greens and dark chocolate. <laughs> um, we have the kidney and that's salty. So if there's someone that's really craving a lot of salt foods, they can be maybe some kidney deficiency there. Yeah. <laughs> and then the spleen is sweetness. So if we're really gravitating that, you know, we may have some spleen chi deficiency for really craving the sweets. Um, and lungs are pungent. Mm. So I like sweet and salty, but I avoid sour and bitter at all mm -hmm. costs. What's going on with me? Mm. <laughs> No, those are probably be good for you then. They probably yeah. would be good for me. Well, you know, with the digestive juice, it helps me because it gets me more trained to that mm -hmm. bitter flavor. And then, you know, even dark chocolate, like mm -hmm. you said, it is a bitter food when it's mm -hmm. very dark. Yeah. So I think getting kids introduced to bitters, even just a mm -hmm. bit of dark chocolate for them before or after a meal can just be a nice introduction right. to get that flavor on their palate. And then in like Chinese food, they're all about the having those flavors in there. Yes, having all five of them mm -hmm. for a balanced meal. So each organ gets a little bit of love. Yeah, and the colors too. The colors. Yeah. And so the, we're going to talk about with the um, solutions for liver yeah. cheese stagnation, those green and sour mm -hmm. foods. But I wanted to ask one more question on that because, um, I, again, I love making the mm -hmm. connections to the habits with the theory. What about someone who loves sour candy and can't stop with the sour? Would they need liver support? Hmm. Maybe I would probably have to ask a bunch more questions. Oh, okay. maybe they're just, just really delicious candy. Next episode, know. live intake. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, because Nick is always like lemon on everything, mm. like sour on everything. He wants every meal to be predominantly sour. 
Hmm. And, you know, he had a history of like some allergies, like some seasonal allergies, which is kind mm-hmm. of a liver kind of thing. Well, not anymore. I know he takes allergy defense tonic now, which we love. So, okay, back to liver cheese stagnation. Why would someone with PMS, cramps, hormone imbalances, PCOS, cysts, headaches around their menstrual cycle, or even anxiety and depression, or even thyroid issues, Mm -hmm. care about liver cheese stagnation? What is the deal with this pattern? How do we get it? And how do we come back to balance? Right. Okay. So yes, some of the classic PMS symptoms also in their breast tenderness. I love to talk about that. Yes. I had a patient last night, actually, she was like, her period was coming soon and her, like, she was like, my breasts are really sore and tender. And she's I was like, why? Well, she had like the most stressful month ever. Like Aww. move it, had to find an apartment immediately. I'm like, oh, we're going to talk about that tomorrow on the podcast. Ooh. <laughs> so the liver, yeah, liver cheese stagnation can give you all those symptoms you mentioned. Also like this distension and bloating, that's like a bloating of your breast too. So for that, you know, tenderness, um, frequent sighing. Oh my God. <sighs> like uh. sighing, sighing is a relate a way to release that, yeah. that stuck chi. Also often I'll see patients come in with like rib side pain. So pain under your ribs in your like hypochondriac area. They've been to the, all the doctors got all the tests. Everything comes out fine. We're like, Oh, that's, that's stress. That's yeah. your liver, your liver chi being stuck. So I, f- I forgot the question, but... No, I love yeah. the tangent that we're getting on because I wanted to ask about um, tight oh. bras. Oh, Would right. that be also constricting the liver chi since Pro- it's right there? It could be. Yeah, I actually never really thought of it in that way. I always tell patients about not wearing too many sports bras oh. because we have so much like neck shoulder tension. And if you're not working out, like I wouldn't be just wearing those on a daily basis mm. because most of those sports bras are tight, like the racer backs. Yeah. Right? They're a little uncomfortable. They're annoying. You're, so you're using your neck to hold up your heavy you boobs. more headaches. <laughs> yeah. That can be giving you more headaches. So wow. just be a little careful with that. So free the boobies, right? Yeah. Okay. Just be comfortable. We love that. <laughs> yeah. Nick is over there like, I'm down. Yeah. But <laughs> like as far as a why we care about this liver cheese stagnation, uh, yeah, it affects our mood. Like that irritability or those really high emotions or like dreading that time of the month. It does not have to be like that. Oh, like, yes. And pain, cramps, right? Like yeah. this is my favorite thing to to treat too because like sometimes after one treatment, they'll, they'll report back at their next period. It's like, oh my gosh, like I barely had any cramps. Like That's such a powerful thing. It doesn't have to be like that. Yeah, no, like you do not have to suffer. Like you do not have to pop pain pills. You know, wow. and a treatment for this at your mm-hmm. office would usually include acupuncture and then also some herbs as well. Yeah. Okay. I like to combine um, some people, you know, want to just start with acupuncture and that's fine. We can do that. The herbs can, you know, get you better a little faster. Okay. I did want to just come back to that mm-hmm. thyroid connection because, mm-hmm. and, and even PCOS because mm-hmm. PCOS mm-hmm. and thyroid issues are often comorbid. Right. Um, but there is that channel. I'm going to mm-hmm. butcher it. Is it the Chan the Mai? Chong or the Ren? The Chong? The Chong. chong. Mm-hmm. So it's actually good. It's like hitting the thyroid. Yeah. So when the liver is stagnant, isn't mm-hmm. that going to kind of reflect that stagnation up to the thyroid in a way? Definitely. Yeah. And it's all connected. Okay. So by moving that chi, you, yeah, you might have a blockage there. Mm. And then the smooth flow of chi equals mm-hmm. the smooth flow of hormones. So PCOS, this is important, estrogen dominance. Yeah. So we want to get our liver chi going. For sure. Yeah. If the liver is stuck, like first just soothe the liver, you know? Yes. And then we can. Okay. So let's talk about that. Teach us all about soothing the liver, foods, habits, acupressure points. How are we going to get this better? Okay. Um, (laughs) Good question. (laughs) So, so many people, you know, start their morning with, you know, meditation or some deep breathing. That's great. Like if you can do that, I honestly, like being honest, I don't, I really should. (laughs) Me neither. Like (laughs) I need to soothe my liver a little bit. I'm, I'm lucky that I'm, I'm just, I think naturally I grew up with this medicine. So it's like, it's in my blood and I grew up taking herbs. I, 
I've like had, I think I have Eleuthero in my blood, literally. Oh, that's that is her. That's my number one favorite herb all time. It's his favorite herb of all yeah. time too. That's so sweet. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I love it. Because it's just so harmonizing and balancing. Oh, it's God. neutral, you know? So you need good. energy. It'll give you energy. If you need to chill out, it can chill you out. Oh, so this is so a nice liver stagnation It's a really herb. good adaptogen. Yeah. Ooh. It's like a number one. It's just like the everything herb too. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. Nasia's mom was having some serious mm. like liver yang rising, anxiety, yeah. heat in the heart type stuff mm -hmm. related to some liver stagnation because mm -hmm. she's kind of not processing stress, mm -hmm. which we all yeah. have a trouble with, right? Yeah. Have a trouble with. Um, so <laughs> Nasia's mom started on some astragalus, mm -hmm. some eleuthero. Um, I had originally thought American ginseng for her because she's mm -hmm. a little bit older and like mm -hmm. it's nice for the yin and yeah. all that, but so is eleuthero. So yeah, we're I good. love eleuthero. So if someone's not going to start their day with some meditation, at least get a cup of eleuthero tea going. Yeah. That's our take on that. And yeah. then you know, next week we'll try the meditation. Yeah, there we go. So other foods, habits, and herbs? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the green green foods, of course, like not all raw, but cooked. So um, those like dandelion and mm. those. Those nice those bitter greens that you can greens, cook yeah. in some healthy fat, mm -hmm. put in some soups. Um, and then maybe a little bit of sour in there because mm -hmm. the... The liver does like sour. So lemon water. Maybe they could start with lemon water Ooh. in the morning. Ooh. That's like a very common thing. Now, would lemon do. water be too drying for some folks? Maybe for some, but mm -hmm. maybe not every day. Okay. So put a feel. little lemon in your Eleuthero yeah. tea. There you go. <laughs> We're just going to keep going back to that. Um, and then uh, breathing, you know, breathing. Re remember to breathe. And so the sighing that mm -hmm. you said as a way to release the liver chi. Mm-hmm. I had a massage therapist who was like, not only do I want you to de to breathe deeply, mm -hmm. I want you to like make a noise, like a mm -hmm. ha. Yeah, yeah. And then that that sounds like your own qigong too. Oh, so qigong, right? Because the organs have different sounds too. Okay. Yeah. My dad is always telling me. So my dad's a doctor of acupuncture. Yeah, also. I'm, that's so my next question. I want to talk about his qigong. thing. His like is uh, the answer to everything is tai chi or qigong. Any, anything I have, you need to do your Tai Chi. Tai Chi Qigong. Like, it's a broken record, and eventually one day I will do it <laughs> for everything. So one can get started dabbling into the art of Qigong yeah. with some breathing exercises, yeah. right? There's a really nice one, which I'm probably going to do a video and teach people. Um, it's called Raising Lotus, and it actually activates all your meridians. So you're like, you're breathing in breathing out. Maybe we can do that later. Oh yeah, yeah. for sure. So. And then any acupressure points before we get into your mm -hmm. dad and your family yeah. lineage that people can use for liver stagnation at home. Yeah. So the point between your big toe and the one right next to it. So that's your liver three. So if you go up and massage where it's tender, mm -hmm. most people have really tender spots. That's a good one for to move your liver chi. Mm -hmm. And then this point here, yeah, this I, is I the classic <laughs> common large intestine four. It's one of the number one points to move the chi in the whole body. So it connects with that one too. So you can massage that one. Is this good for constipation? It's the large intestine, so it can help with digestive. Yeah. Mm. It's like also another everything point. <laughs> um, not to be massaged during pregnancy, though. Yes. Um, contraindicated because it's so moving. Um, but it's also great for headaches because it's the master point of the face, like the head face. So any jaw issues also, you can massage this one. Okay. So yeah. we'll put some links in the yeah. show notes as well to actual like diagrams so mm -hmm. that you can find these points mm -hmm. on yourself. And then another favorite is the spleen six. Mm -hmm. So like your four fingers up from the medial malleolus, mm -hmm. there's a nice depression. Um, my ankle's a little. Yeah, right in there. So you'll find a tender spot. This, the damn spleen, a uh, really, really great one for cramps. So massage that like really hard. But not during circulate. pregnancy. Not during pregnancy. Also another one we avoid, but really excellent for cramps. That is tender yeah. on me. That's Whew. good. Also, you like your whole spleen channel would be good. Okay. Love that. Mm -hmm. and that's why I love getting lymph massages mm -hmm. here. Okay, so yeah. tell us about your family history and that your dad yeah. is the one who kind of passed this down to you. Yes, yeah, so both my parents are actually acupuncturists. Whoa. Yeah. Um, this is like back in the day. My dad actually took the first California acupuncture board exam ever. It was, I think, 76. Um, so he was practicing, and then he actually met my mom in England when she was at acupuncture school oh. from like a mutual friend. 
We'd love so, a spleen chi love story. Yeah. <laughs> it might have been like during a Tai Chi class too. Oh yeah. my goodness. So does he teach you Tai Chi at home? Yes. I've been doing it since I was three years old. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, th that, yeah, that is his thing. Like as we get older, he's like, you're not going to be able to do flips because I do this capoeira. It's mm -hmm. Afro-Brazilian martial art. It's like acrobatics and all this. Oh, wow. Um, I love that. Movement. He's like, do your Tai Chi. <laughs> so what are some like pearls of wisdom that your dad always goes back to other than the do your Tai Chi? Mm -hmm. What are some of his like saying? Uh, yeah. Like still, I'm, I'm going to be 35 next year. Still. Do you have a jacket? Like, <laughs> don't go outside cold. Like, where's your jacket? Like, but talk to us about the Chinese reasoning. Uh, for yeah. That. The, the wind attack. Uh, Keep your neck covered. Yes. Yeah. So pathogens we think of like these external evils like the wind can enter through our neck we have all these points on the back of our neck that actually have wind in their name so we're exposed we're like open here so they say like catch a cold with the wind yeah it can actually and i think every grandma yeah, says put a, that hat on because that's also the point that your yang yeah. point at the top of your mm -hmm. head which also i mean i've heard some acupuncturists say to not wash your hair a ton while you're menstruating because it's mm. the cold yin water on that yang point i mean mm -hmm. that's like a little yeah. extra right if we're really trying to be mm -hmm. perfectly in mm -hmm. line but not everyone can do that but yeah. just an interesting little anecdote and so yeah this concept of wind and can you talk about how sometimes pain conditions have mm -hmm. that wind element where they travel right yeah so some of the arthritis um, comes and goes also with the weather mm -hmm. like if someone wakes up extra achy they might like might actually rain that day because they could feel it in their body or if it's you know, been windy out, it can flare up some migraines or headaches for some people. Because, huh. like, it can come and go, that wind aspect, too. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, covering up the neck, staying warm, um, eating properly, like, yeah. eat your meals, sit down and eat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are probably the, the biggest takeaways that he gives me. <laughs> Interesting. So basic. Like, They're so, so basic, basic. But if so, if people just stuck to those three yeah. things, cover up, eat yeah. warm food, eat at regular and times. Don't walk around barefoot. Of mm. course, you know that one. Yeah, right? of course. Um, and that's for also kidney. Kidney. Yeah, because the kidney channel is down at the bottom of the foot. I and see. then like keep your, you know, keep your belly and your low back covered. Don't sit on like cold benches. Oh that's important. Wow. The things you wouldn't think about. One thing I forgot about mm -hmm. with the liver mm -hmm. is the hun or the... Oh, yeah, the hun. Talk to us about that. Okay. So the hun is like this ener the energetic aspect of the liver. In Chinese medicine, like different organs have these different kind of spirits. Mm -hmm. So the hun is... We think of, I, I think of like this floating thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You might have a different imagery of it. But when that is rooted, we're like, things are good. We feel settled. But it's common if you like wake up at two or three in the morning, like you sleep well, but then you're you're up at that hour. That means your hun is floating. Like we want it to be settled. And blood is a big aspect of that. I know we haven't even really touched on blood, yeah. but... Uh, like a deficiency or lack of blood mm -hmm. can make the the hun float. <laughs> so we want to root it. Very interesting. So, cause I know so many people that I speak to are like, I wake up like clockwork at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously liver time. Yeah. But you're connecting it to that spiritual aspect mm -hmm. of the hun not being grounded. Yeah. And also just not feeling settled in life in general. Like if you have a lot of anxiety or stresses or like worries, if you're not, re if you're not really feel grounded mm. and settled, like it's going to give you sleep problems. And but that if you're, makes sense why yeah. it's so hard to sleep when you're traveling. Yeah. And if you're like really content, everything is good. Like you should sleep really well. Love yeah. that. So where do vivid dreams come in? So vivid dreams is a bit of we're getting into the heart now. It's like this mm -hmm. heart heat. So I always look at my patient's tongue and if they have like a, a red tip mm -hmm. that uh, the heart is the tip of your tongue, that area, let's stick it out. Yeah, so we'll, it'll, <laughs> if you have some heart heat or if you've had insomnia, Ooh, yeah. You so can tell them it's a little, the you know, it's, it can come and go too. You might not always have it, but mm -hmm. you know, if you have a lot going on, yeah, you might have 
be more prone to vivid dreams. I've just had so much trouble sleeping since I've gotten mm. here, but I think it's that, you know, I'm you're, yeah. I'm in an Airbnb. I'm not in my house. I'm not yeah. settled. It's a new project. And it's you're exciting. doing all these new things. Yeah. Yeah. And I've just been having vivid rhinoceros dreams. Big rhinoceros in my dream last night, you guys. It was like rolling oh. through the city, creating rubble everywhere. I don't know. Mm. It's definitely, I always dry, have dreams with animals in them. Hmm. Do you have any? Uh, that's interesting. No. <laughs> I don't know. That's probably related know. to, I don't know what. But, um, okay, cool. So since the hun goes into the liver mm -hmm. while we sleep, mm -hmm. um, just having dreams in general, maybe pleasant dreams mm -hmm. or dreaming about your life or even mm -hmm. daydreaming, having mm -hmm. the ability to daydream and kind of have this vision for your life during mm -hmm. the day would also kind of be from that healthy liver meridian, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, dreams are normal mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. It's just if they are disturbing or excessive, yeah. that it might be an issue. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so the last thing I wanted to touch on, I know we're running out of time mm -hmm. here, but you're just, I could talk to you about this all day. <laughs> we'll have to do another one. Sometimes. We'll have to do yeah. another one for sure. And I think our, our next one, to give people a teaser, mm -hmm. we should do herbs for beauty and skin because oh, you're yeah. teaching a workshop on that. Okay. Um, so talk to us a bit about that workshop and what you're going to be touching on and what we can learn in our next episode. Oh, yeah. So... Um, I'm actually, you know, recently be get, been getting into the cosmetic acupuncture. It's a whole nother aspect. Uh, and actually, I kind of stayed away from it for a while. Everyone was interested in it, and it's great, but, you know, I'm, I'm busy treating everything else. Mm -hmm. But I've... I've realized this is really great. I'm gonna. I need to start doing it now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Prevention. So with acupuncture for facial rejuvenation, building the collagen, a really great like Botox alternative. Yeah. So it's excellent. And then there's herbs we can take that you know just. What are some examples? Give us like a tea, okay, like uh, a luthero. Yeah, uh, tremella. Tr I love that. Do you know that mushroom? No. Mm. So this is a great one. Uh, really good for. Um, also building like the hydrolon hydro, I can't speak right now. Hyaluronic. Hyaluronic acid. Yes. yes. So hydrating, moisturizing, anti-aging, really great for the wrinkles. So Nage wanted a hyaluronic Trimel acid topical, but Trimela, no, just <laughs> Tremella, yeah. Um, there's a great company, Addictive Wellness. I love yeah. they have they have a Tremella powder. Oh, perfect. Um, and you can just add it into And that's probably a yin tonic? Mm -hmm. Kidney yeah. yin? Uh, stomach and lung. Oh, okay. Yeah. So stomach and lung yin would relate to the skin. So if you're- This particular one. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so that's that's one. And then pearl powder. Mm -hmm. We love the pearl. Classic Chinese herbal. Also good for our shen. Oh, yes. So I talked have, in my episode with Dr. Uh, Doctor Z. Oh, yeah. We talked about the Shen a little bit, but mm -hmm. I think we have to talk about that too in our next episode. Okay. Like some Shen tonics, ways mm -hmm. to calm and ground the Shen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I feel like we've just given people a yeah. really cool place to start. And then um, I do also love some Western herbs for the skin. Um, <laughs> evening primrose and royal jelly. Royal jelly not being so Western, but... So evening primrose, evening primrose oil, oil capsules. Oil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have a favorite formula and it's evening primrose royal jelly. And it actually does have some Korean ginseng in it oh. um, for hormone balance and Ooh. really great for PMS. And, and do you make that formula? I don't make it. Okay. Um, it's just a company that I really like. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. So maybe we can link that in the show notes yeah, too give people yeah. the resources love that definitely um yes okay so we're gonna get into those western herbs for skin next time mm -hmm. we all want to know how to increase our collagen mm -hmm. one that i know of is go to cola that's not mm -hmm. a western herb it's an ayurvedic mm -hmm. herb but my teachers are always talking about collagen with that herb and maybe we can even talk about hair loss and blood deficiency mm -hmm. i have a formula for that that's based on chinese medicine yeah um, I've looked so. through those ingredients. I love your formulations too. They're Thank really excellent. You. See, that one was co-formulated with mm -hmm. an, an OMD. Mm -hmm. So I, I am very careful to also know my limits yeah. and <laughs> co-formulate with people who really understand and can help me to refine my own formulations. Mm -hmm. So... Wow. Thank you so much. And I'm really excited to chat again. So before we totally wrap up and say goodbye and show people where they can find you, I'd like to ask my two closing questions. And the first one is, what keeps you juicy? What keeps me juicy? Like what keeps Ooh, your yin yeah, nourished? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. <laughs> I would just say just life. Like I love what I do. So that's I just feel so happy and grateful to be doing what I love to do. And mm, it's being yeah. in your purpose. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's really nice. The second question is what keeps you spicy? What keeps me spicy? <laughs> Maybe my husband. No. <laughs> What's his sign? He's a Pisces. Oh, interesting. We're very complimentary, very, oh. very yin and yang. Mm. So we balance each other well. I love that. All right. Thank you so much. I would love for you to share with the audience where they can find you, how they can work with you, what your website is and all that good stuff. Yeah. So I can be uh, found on Instagram at dr.kara, K-A-R-A dot A-C-U-L-A-N-D, Aculand, or uh, website is Dr. Kara Aculand. Um, send me a message, email. Um, we're open six days a week. Um, I have an associate who works on the weekends and you can find me there. Okay, perfect. So we'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, and thank you so much again, Dr. Kara. Thanks so much for having me. You're this wonderful. Was so much fun. Stay juicy. Stay juicy. <laughs> Well, guys, I hope that you loved that episode. I hope that you loved Dr. Kara. And I cannot believe the support of the podcast that you guys have continued to show, even when I took last month off to care for my parents and deal with the craziness in my life. So I just want to say thank you so much to all of you who've been listening and sharing the podcast. I know that we are all quarantined right now and our schedules are a bit off and life doesn't even feel real sometimes, but I still feel like we're in it together. And this podcast is a place where we can kind of come together on Mondays, feel a little bit more normal, connect with each other, learn something and, you know, just get our fix. So if you enjoyed this episode, please send it to someone who needs a new podcast to listen to, someone who could use a quarantine aid, a stress reliever, or someone who just loves to nerd out on health and alternative medicine, all that good stuff. Um, also, I mean, obviously every podcaster says this and sometimes it feels a little unnatural for me to say it, but it really does help. So if you guys feel like rating us on iTunes, leaving us a review, it really helps more people find us um, and is just amazing for everything that we're trying to do here. So thank you. Thank you so much to our loyal listeners and supporters. We love you guys and you are the reason that we show up here every Monday and do our thing. So I'll see you next week. Hope you have a great week, guys. Great. And thanks to everyone for listening. Share this episode if you liked it. If you didn't, all good. <laughs> I like I never know how to end these freaking episodes, but we'll do that after. Okay. Thank you. Bye.